Hello, Tracy from Salem. A beleaguered Tracy from Salem because this is the third, fourth time I am attempting to film this video. <laughs> I, I don't know what, I don't know what. Something in the universe is just dead set against me making this video. And this will be my last attempt. <clears throat> but, but I'm here. Here I am. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into like, you know, all the things of like, oh, I forgot I had an alarm set on my phone, which then turned off the video. Or I just filmed two hours because, yes, I did for work learn how to edit some edit videos on YouTube. And um, so I filmed like two hours yesterday. And then uh, I'm, I, I'm not even going to go into it. Here I am. Here I am. And this time it'll work or it will just never get made. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to show some finished pieces that from previous videos. And um, then I thought I would do a little work um, on a process called um, Kawandi, um, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, here's a here is the um, log cabin piece finished. Um, I think in my last video, I was torturing myself with what a uh, piece of fabric to use as the kind of the binding of all the squares. And I just, in the end, I love all those fabrics. And in the end, I just couldn't get into any of them working for this piece. So I decided to uh, K3N on her, just on her um, log cabin videos, showed another process for binding them, which is to, you know, put two squares face together and then stitch and then st stitch them all together that way. And so that's what I did. Um, and then I took this, the outer log cavern fabric and I made a binding for it. Um, and then I took this piece of sari rope and it comes, let me zoom in. So this is one of the reasons that it didn't work because yesterday when I filmed for two hours, I didn't realize that I was super zoomed in the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and that you couldn't see anything I was doing. So, um, but you can see this sari ribbon, it came already bound into a kind of a rope-like thing. Not in the same way that um, Catherine does hers, uh, but that's how it comes. And so I just couched that down. Um, so this is a lot of sewing for me. I'm not a quilter. I'm not a sewist. I'm an embroiderer. Um, and so this was a lot of sewing for me and, and I enjoyed it. Um, and I will do more of it. Um, although I have a big learning curve for sure, which you'll see when I get to the Pajagi piece. Um, but I did put some embroidery as I showed in the previous videos. I did, um, trellis stitch and weaving stitch for my hearths and then couched down the center. So, yeah, so that is that. Oh, and then I put that, that same fabric um, on the backing as a back, and I made like a little well, and um, you can see it's sunny today, so hopefully later, because it's been not sunny for a while, <laughs> um, hopefully later I'll go out for a walk, and I will find just the perfect stick, which is out there waiting for me as a reward for shooting this video one more freaking time. <laughs> um, but now here's a question I have, and um, hopefully someone will know the answer. Uh, I really want to put a stick in here and hang it um, because I feel like that would kind of speak to the idea of a log cabin. But I know that you have to, um, that, that, uh, that wood and fabric don't play nice together. And so I feel like I have to do something to the wood so that it won't eat away at the fabric. And maybe maybe there isn't anything you can do to wood so that it won't eat away at fabric. And this is hardly, you know, a, 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 an archival piece. It's just fun. Something went crazy wrong with the camera there, with the lighting. So luckily, I, I learned some editing tips. 
Okay, so uh, just to finish this up, the question is, uh, what do I do with a stick to make it so that it won't destroy the fabric? If if that isn't even possible, like I figure, maybe I probably have to sand it, right? Do I put do I put beeswax on it? Do I put stain on it? Is there some other coating I put on it so that it doesn't interact poorly with the fabric? Please put any responses in the comments section. Um, anyway, okay, so that's that's that. Then, um, yeah, so I did the Pajagi, um, which is week eight of the K3N slow stitch uh, project. And, you know, like, it's okay. I, I will tell you that this made me crazy. Can I put it in the sun so you can see through it? It doesn't really, it doesn't really work. Not as well as hanging it up against a window. Um, this made me completely nuts, this technique. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an embroiderer, not a sewist. Um, one reason for that, well, I mean, the main reason is I just really love embroidery. But some secondary reasons are that, um, I, so me and numbers, just, I can't, I, I just don't grasp them very well. So to have a piece where, so I was trying for something that was four and a half by seven, not, um, that's what I was trying for. But in order to actually accomplish a particular size, you actually have to like, be thoughtful about the fact that on some of the pieces, the um, hem is a half an inch and on some of them it's a quarter inch or, you know, some, th those numbers don't have to be the numbers, but they're, but they're not the same hem is the point. <laughs> like my brain, like really is like smoke was coming out of my ears. Uh, and then secondly, I have, um, I don't, so some people understand structure and dimensionality and yeah and structure right so they can like they can look at a building and understand the architecture and the structure of the of how, and i just look and it's pretty to me and beautiful and whatever or, or not alternatively speaking um but i like spatial things and structure things and so like with every single piece it was as if i was doing it for the first time like wait, now how do I put these two together so that it works? And forget about trying to have all the pieces have their double um, seams all on the top and the single seams all on the bottom. I mean, freaking forget it, forget it. So I, I was made super crazy. Now I'm imagining that my ego <laughs> will not be satisfied with this piece as as like my only attempt at Pajagi. I feel certain I will try it again just so I can say I can do it. <laughs> I and I've, I'm fully I'm I fully own that that is my ego talking. Um, and that I am, I am not competitive with other people at all, but I am kind of competitive with myself maybe. <laughs> so I, I imagine that something else will happen. Um, but for now I'm just, this is just going in the book and I am saying goodbye to that technique for a while. So in the last video, I did show these, um, pieces, which I wanted to just share again. Um, they are from a um an online class that I took with Karen Turner. She's on Instagram and um she has a website and she does this cool like a stitch a day thing for 365 days and she makes like a, a book out of it. It's it's hard to explain, but if you went to Karen Turner's um um Instagram or her website website's probably better and then when she's done with it she like sells the pattern on her website so that other people can also do that oh my, my leg is falling asleep um anyway this fall she came out with her I think it's called stitch a little landscape and it's an online um class and I'll put the the deets in the box below 
Um, and so I, I thought this is a wonderful way to have like a little project I can work on when I don't have anything else big that I'm working on. And, but I can still create something kind of lovely. Like I do also have a stitch diary cloth, which is just a, a big piece of linen that I practice my stitches on. Um, but sometimes you actually want to create something, but without it being like a whole big massive thing. So this is, this is a delightful way to do that. Um, so this piece is an ode to the landscape I live in. Um, I've, I've mentioned before that I live in Massachusetts and I live in Salem, which is on the Eastern seaboard. So I live right on the edge of the North American continent. It's delightful. And I can see the ocean from down the street. Um, and the whole Eastern seaboard is marshland, right, right, right up the coast is marshland. And it's my favorite bioregion. Uh, so this is an ode. So this is, um, this is the Parker River, which is in, on the North Shore of Massachusetts. And um, it's one of those beautiful um, cloths designed by um, Aboriginal artisans in Australia. Um, and I, f I think I made this in October. Uh, and it happened to be the full moon then, although I put moons in, mo in a lot of my work. Um, and there you can see the, my, my reeds and my sea grasses um, and the darkening sky as the moon rises. Um, this one is um, just an imagined landscape, although there are a lot of farms in Massachusetts. Um, I love... I love, love, love these sheep she taught us how to make. Aren't they so adorable? Um, and she, you know, she teaches you how to make fences. And then I got, of course, I had to get some more reeds in. Um, this, there are no standing stones in Massachusetts uh, that I know of. There are in New Hampshire, which is a state uh, just north of us. Um, but there are no standing stones in Massachusetts. I just put that in there because... It's uh, it's a little bit part of my a little bit part of my heritage. My my ancestors on both sides of my family are almost entirely from the British Isles and from um, uh, parts of France and parts of Scandinavia. So a, a place rich with standing stones. Although I think there's standing stones all over the world, and um, yeah, and there are some there are. Uh, ancient earthwork things even here in the United States. Um, although not, there's no ancient standing stones. There are standing stones, but they're not ancient. Um, but anyway, um, this, this is what's called the Oum alphabet, um, which is a Celtic alphabet. Um, and this does say something, but I have forgotten <laughs> what, what I wrote there. Um, and here's my last one where I just made those standing stones front and center. Um, I, ch I went for, I was going for like a real, um, the moment of sunset here, right? Where it's just a teeny little bit of red fire at the horizon line. And then because of that little teeny bit of red fire, the landscape is like black silhouette. Um, and I got way into like, you know, putting grooves in the stones and blah, blah. I can, I do remember what this says. It says moonlight. Um, I tried, I tried to make some shadows like from the moon, right? So there's, so the seed stitching here is like a darker green. Eh, eh. The other thing I feel eh about on this one is this do peony silk. Um, and uh, because the thing is, the second you cut the dupioni silk, it just frays cra like crazy, which which just for this particular piece, I personally don't really feel like it works. I'm not beating myself up at all. I'm just this this was a learning on this piece. Uh, yeah, dupioni silk only for certain things, or be able to um, you know tuck it under or you know whatever. Learnings. Learnings abound. So this is not my fave. This is definitely my fave. <laughs> uh, this, I think that's, yeah, I'm pleased with that. Um, so yeah, Karen Turner.
check it out. Stitch little stitch landscapes or stitch little landscapes or some, something. I'll put it, I'll put it in the box. So the other piece I, I was going to show are these Kawandi, which, well, let me, sorry, let me say that differently. Kawandi inspired. Um, so Kawandi it means quilt. So you don't say Kawandi quilt. You say just Kawandi. That means quilt. And the Kawandi, Kawandi is a, a technique um, that uh, folks of African descent living in West India, the Cedis, that is what they're called, the, the people, the Cedis. Um, and that's how they say quilt. And um, the, so it turns out there's there were multiple waves of Africans who went to India and just to be, you know, super transparent, uh, kind of the last wave um, around the 16th century, they were brought as slaves from Africa to um, to India by Europeans. Um, they're very poor. And the Indian, the the people of India aren't too keen on them. So they really live in like their own enclave. Um, and uh, so there's some hard history, hard history there. Um, anyway, uh, they have this technique for making um, quilts. Uh, and th these are, these claws are inspired by them. Um, so I have made mine differently. Uh, I've used some different ways of going about things. Um, but what's cool about them, so they are, uh, so the way they do it is they take scraps of clothes that can no longer be used as clothes and they piece them to get, they have a backing cloth, um, usually sari, and they they piece them on and they stitch them down with a cantha stitch or a running stitch. Uh, and it goes from the outside in. Um, and frequently what they'll do is they'll put in the middle, they might put uh, a piece of stitch, a piece of cloth that is stitched with some kind of a religious symbol or, and they also probably put rice if they have any, they put some grains of rice um, in the middle to, and then when they give them, oh, sorry, my leg is really, really going to sleep. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and then they, they gift them. Uh, and the idea about the rice in the middle is like, may your house always never go hungry. You know, may you always have food. Um, so um, I thought I would work on one of these. Um, I recently used this. Uh, so they also, they have, um, have they usually put these in the corner, and I think the word they use, the, the word is pula. I, I might be mispronouncing that um, pula, which means flower. And they don't believe the, the cloth is not fully done, not fully dressed until they have their pula in. Um, and so um, I really wanted to have like a cor a, a, a contrast color, um, and so I put that in in the middle of my cloth. Um, and then, oh, let me just say this one last thing. You, they're very careful about the about the cantha stitching because it goes all the way through and then creates a design on the back. Pretty cool, huh? Um, so this one I did with a with like a pearl cotton, and then this one I did with like a um a tw like a thread, a sewing thread, um, just to see what it would be like. So you do have to be quite mindful of your stitching because then you, you because you don't want stuff like that right um i have a bunch of you know off angle um stitches uh but you know that's fine um that's fine so yeah this one came out this one came out better although i do see a few rogues here and there <laughs> Anyway, and the, so I think the point, I think the point is you just, you never, you never stop, right? When you get around here, you just go in a step. Uh, 
right? So you're not tying off a knot and then starting again. You are so, so going in, going in a step. So, um, yeah, do I want to say anything else about the CDs or about um, Kawandi? Um, they, um, well, so I've, so I've read a couple different things. I watched a couple different people. Um, and, um, the, the article that I read that seemed to have sort of like the most, uh, respectable scholarship to it says that they do not use stuffing, that they do not put, um, uh, n there's no batting. They, the strips are sewn directly onto the back backing cloth. Um, a lot of the videos I've seen by, uh, you know, Americans, um, not the CD people, put, uh, put an extra layer between. And I've, I've seen, I've heard some people say that the CD do put, um, they'll, they'll just take like extra raw, uh, sari, um, and put an extra layer of, layer of sari between, the pieces are sewing on and, and the backing material. So um, I don't know the exact answer, the exact right truthful answer, um, according to the CD people, about whether they put something in between or not. Um, I put something in between on both of these. Um, and I just, I like, it just gives it a little, I mean, it's very, you know, it's very soft and tactile and mobile and flexible, but I like just a little bit extra, a little bit of extra weight. And all I did was I put a, another piece of this um, linen inside here. So anyway, that is that. And so I have in my basket the makings of a, a Kwandi, another Kwandi, because what I'll, I'll show you why, because Recently, I took this to um, a gathering of friends in which we were giving each other um, uh, card readings, and I found it to be a very delightful card reading cloth. Um, and so I really want another one that is, uh, yeah. It's a delightful reading cloth, yes? Um, so that's why I'm making another one that is a little bit more in my, um, well, my color palette. Obviously, blues blues are my major color palette. And my other major color palette is purples. And so I, um, I'm going to make a Kiwandi cloth uh, with these. So I got out these fabrics, which I had been, which I already had out. I should, I didn't get them out. I already had them out um, because I was making the Pojagi with these cloths, with some of these cloths anyway. Um, some of them are <laughs> like, this is what I did in lockdown. <laughs> I do not have a kitchen for massive dye experiments. Um, it's, I, I live in an apartment. It's a small kitchen. You can just only do so much in there. So like the whole, uh, um, uh, like with, with the mordant and then the plant dyes and all the things. Well, so I think you already know that plant dyes are not really my color palette, but also like I can't do the multiple steps, all the things. So I just ordered a tie dye kit is what I did. And you don't have to mordant anything <laughs> with a tie dye kit, and um, and this is so. So some of these claws I dyed, uh, and some of them um, I bought, and um, some of them other people dyed. Like this, I bought already dyed. Isn't that just stunning? Um, so yeah, so these are my cloths, cloths, and this is my backing fabric. I don't know what this is called. It is super tricksy, which I forgot. I'd used it, I haven't used it in quite a long time, and I forgot how slickery it is. You can see like the texture is kind of built in. Um, it's a bit stretchy, and so you can really you really have to go slow and careful with this stuff. But so I'm gonna use this as the backing and I'm also gonna um, cut a piece to go inside as my stuffing. Um, and at first, so then I had all these various and sundry um, 
um, threads that I was contemplating. Some of them are, you know, this is these are like what eight weights um, pearl cottons, and some of them because uh, one of the one of those claws I did I did with this uh, uh, twelve weight Egyptian cotton, um, but this backing fabric you can't really see those twelve weights, so I I dismissed those and then. Also, uh, you know, purple, the, the complementary color of purple is yellow. So I contemplated all these yellows um, because I thought that would be pretty fun to have that complementary. But, but you know what, in the end, uh, this particular purple, I don't, I don't really think that works so well with these yellows. Um, so in the end, I decided on this guy. So that's my thread. Um, now, let me get things out of the way here. Let's see, get this, these things, and get rid of this guy. I don't know why I keep calling all my things guys. I don't know why everything is suddenly <laughs> masculine gendered in my house. I don't, um, but there you go. Who knows? The vagaries of language. Um, so anyway... In yesterday's installment of this video fiasco, I was doing the first round, but then that video, sadly, is not, yeah, anyway. Um, so unfortunately, the first round's already done, but let me tell you the basics of how it works. Um, so what I did, so, from what I've seen and heard from other folks, and again, these are, you know, um, American women, not CD women. So I don't know exactly for sure from the perspective of a CD woman, how, how they do it. But from what I've heard and read, um, they, they just basically, so you have your backing fabric and you just roll a little bit of a, a little bit of a hem over and you put your first piece down and you start you start with your um uh with your cantha stitch your running stitch so my understanding is that they don't use pins um that they um they just they don't use clips they don't use anything like that they just use the running stitch and that's how they tack everything down i am not that coordinated I'm really not very coordinated at all. I'm not a dexterous person, um, but I pursue fiber arts because I love them, but I'm not a dexterous person. So I did use, I used my clips, these guys. Um, you can also, you could use, um, you could use pins, you could use um, applique pins, uh, whatever you want. I like the little, the little clampy thingies. Um, and then what you do is, so you start at one corner and you fold. So this piece, I then folded over. Um, let me get a piece of material. I, so I then folded over and put the two folds, the fold of the backing fabric and the fold of the cloth together. Um, and so I pin, you know, use my little clippy things. And then with each new piece, you have to decide um, am I going, which one is going under and which one is going over and whichever one is going over, you're then going to fold that side so that you have the clean, let's see, let me, okay. So I decided that this one was going to go under and this one was going to go over. So I'm folding it here to meet the folded back, um, uh, backing fabric and I'm folding it here to create a clean line over this. And so then I'm gonna, then I come with this piece. Which one is gonna go on top, this one or this one? I can decide uh, differently in every single situation. I decide which one's going under, which one's going over. Then I'm folding this edge to meet the backing cloth. And since this one is on top, I'm folding this edge to cover this one. 
And with each fabric that I put down, I decide which one's going over, which one's going under. Then when you get to the corner here, um, I'm folding, I'm folding the top and I'm folding this side to meet the backing cloth. And if it's going over, I'm then folding this side as well, which is what I did. So once I have my first row clipped and I do it with clips, then I start my running stitch and I do that running stitch as close to the top as possible so that I'm sealing the backing cloth and the top cloth together. And I'm making sure that that running stitch is looking good on both sides, right? So I'm constantly paying attention to both sides of the cloth. <clears throat> and when I, get to, when I get to here, and then I go down this side, and then I turn my fabric, and I start doing the same thing, laying out my pieces with the same considerations. Um, whatever's going on top is getting folded over. Now this is all, the first row in particular, super fiddly. And you just go slow and take your time and just enjoy the process. And I happen to really love these colors. So I love seeing how they're coming together. Um, but you gotta go slow because it's, it's fiddly and you're, you know, jockeying multiple foldings. And, and then when you get to this corner, then you do this row and so on and so on all the way around until you have it. And so now I'm back at the first corner, right? And I have all these pieces that are flippy floppy. And um, now I'm just going to um, go around for a couple of rows. I'm just gonna just keep sewing around and stitching down all of these fabrics um, until I get to, until I get my stitches come up here and I'm almost at the edge of a fabric, then I'm gonna need to put something else here and something here. And um, sometimes I'll get to the top of a fabric sooner. Like I'm gonna to get to the top of this fabric sooner than I get to the top of this fabric. Um, but when I get to the top of this one, then I'm gonna lay in a piece here. And so the way it's created is it inward, right? It's all gonna be, I'm gonna be filling in. So I'm just, so when I come here, I'm gonna fill in. And then when I get to here, I'm gonna fill in and fill in here. Then I'm gonna be to the top of these fabrics and I'm gonna fill in, but I'm always doing it in this kind of a towards the center kind of way. And my stitch um, will be running along this way. So let me say a few things that you have to be really mindful of is like when you get to the edge, when you have two fabrics coming together, let's see, let me zoom in. When you have two fabrics coming together, I really wanna make sure that I'm catching these fabrics right at the edge. And so I don't really wanna be taking massive, massive stitches because this massive stitch might end here and then I, and I might be on the other side and then how am I gonna catch that corner? So it, it's small stitches and it's slow going so that you're really being attentive to both sides of the cloth and to the edges, all right? So I really, this is my optimum, I think, is when I'm coming up on this side. Whoa, can you see this? That's better. I'm coming up in this fabric and going down in this fabric. To me, that's like kind of the optimum. You can't always quite manage it, um, right? So here I came up and went down in this, in the pink fabric, uh, but I did it as close to the edge as I possibly could. Um, so these are some of your considerations as you're working. Woo, sorry, I didn't mean to make anyone sick with that camera movement. Now, I've gone all the way around once. Everything's tacked down, and so I'm going to pull these fabrics back because I personally would like to have some stuffing inside. Um, let's see, do I need to come out just a little bit more? Yeah. And so I cut another piece of this fabric. But, you know, here's a great opportunity to use up scraps because whatever's inside doesn't matter, right? It's like when we did, um, if for anyone who's doing the K3N 
uh, slow stitch with K3N 2024 thing, um, when we did our hexes, we, um, we had that whole story that Catherine gave us about how people um, in the past would actually leave the paper in for extra warmth. And they just used scrap paper, right? Sorry, I needed a sip of my tea. Um, so you can just use scraps inside. And um, at least one or at least a few people that I heard talking about Kawandi cloth, uh, when I, Kawandi, when I first started uh, learning about it, uh, did say that they would just use a scrap of sari, whatever scraps they had around. And, you, and in fact, you could actually just sew together a bunch of scraps that, that, and it could look, you know, it doesn't have to look like anything because you're going to put it inside. I'm going to use another piece of the backing cloth. And so now is the moment where I'm going to put it in, right? When I only have one row of stitching done. And um, so I'm going to tuck it into these corners. And try to get it to reach the edges and the corners. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much, yeah. And now I'm gonna fold all of these back. I'm gonna make sure that's lying, lying flat in the corners there. Oh, that's an, that's an underpiece. Just getting all my pieces in their proper over under way. And um, so you, if you want, you can pin. Um, as, you, as you can see, it's a little bit, again, it's fiddly with all these pieces that are folded over. They, don't necess they aren't necessarily keeping their folds. Um, not all of these fabrics hold a, hold a fold, very, fold very well. Um, Can see they're all different sizes so if you want to put in pens you know go ahead no there's no there's no policing here um some of these i might they're so floppy uh and as i said i'm like not the most dexterous person and so i don't want to kind of consistently miss so things i might put in a few pens um, yeah, so one other thing I, f I forgot to mention, because I'm not doing it on this cloth, are the uh, pula, right? So if you want to put pula in the way the CD women do, um, you have to not sew these corners until, right? So when, as you're sewing around, you have to not close up these corners um, until you can get your pula in. So you have to keep that in mind. But I'm not putting those on on mine, so I've gone ahead and, and done the, the corners. So I think that I am going to put some pens, but I think what I'll do, so that I'm not constantly stabbing myself, is to use the applique pens, which I find very frustrating because they're so tiny and I believe I've mentioned multiple times already now that I am not very dexterous. Um, however, the good thing about them is that you don't really stab yourself as frequently. <clears throat> 
with these guys. So this is not, this is, I, I find this technique to be both of precision and not of precision. Uh, because you really need to be attentive to how the stitches are showing up both on the front and the back because you want the back to be a tidy little design. Um, and uh, for the for women who do this technique a lot uh, and it's passed down generation to generation as it w is with the CD women, uh, I think they get pretty darn good at um, nice even canthus stitching. Uh, I am not so good at that, and so I have to be very attentive to see how fiddly these little seams are already, so I'm glad I'm putting pins in, and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Um, I need to, I need to keep myself attentive to, uh, kind of the multiple things that are going on on this cloth. Um, because it's not something I've done a lot of, and, um, I'm a noob, a noob. Uh, so, yeah, but look at these colors. Aren't they just too fun? Too fun. So, yeah, so, um... So buttons, that's that's from a movie. That is from a movie. Uh, what is it called? The something something of dogs and cats. The I don't remember the name of the movie. It's with Uma Thurman and Janine Garofalo and Ben Chaplin. I can remember all of these actors' names, but I cannot remember the name of the movie. Anyway, it's a line from that where one of the characters is just like so, uh, so, they can't think of what to say. And then the other character goes, so buttons? In all the absurdity that, as you might imagine, a line like that. Um, and yeah, that's, I was just about to start going so because I couldn't think of what to say right now while I'm attempting to pen these kinds of things take all my concentration and it's very hard to chit chat and pen at the same time um but i will say that this technique is kind of once you get used to it oh there's my laundry but this time I put the alarm on my watch instead of on my phone. Woohoo! So I did not stop the video. Um, hopefully nobody will toss my laundry out of the dryer because obviously I'm not going down right now. But at least I didn't mess up this video one more time. Crikey. So maybe I'm gonna use my fab new editing skills right here in this moment. Tracy, edit out all this pinning because this is kind of boring. Especially since I can't think of anything fun to talk about right now. I don't, I'm having some kind of brain fart about you know why it's hard to find something fun to talk about right now? Because we just had, and I, I promise I'm not going to go down a whole political thing. But we just had some more primaries. We had the South Carolina primary here in the United States. This is part of what's happening in the States right now as we're in a presidential election year. And what I, I'm not going to talk about politics, but what I am going to talk about is... 
the distressing nature of polarization in my country. Um, I'm going to guess that a lot of people who are watching this might not be the same political party that I am. But we have this lovely thing in common, right? This creative venture in common um, in which we are, yeah, trying to create beauty in, uh, in a tough world. Uh, see, I didn't fold this under before I sewed it. Uh, uh, so I'm kind of jamming it under right now. Yeah, we're here because we want to create things of beauty. We're here because we want to have a space in which we... Um, can spend that time in uh, a kind of a, a meditative practice. Um, and for some people it might be, it might be a prayerful practice. Um, I think art is a very wonderful place to uh, experience to, um, okay, so now <laughs> in the middle, in the middle of that, I need to make sure on the back that I kind of step over and to begin my next row of stitches without those uh, slanty stitches that you saw on the other cloth. So what I did was I went, I went down here, but I didn't go all the way through. I went under the backing cloth and over to the side to start my next row. Um, my next row. I will also say that what I'm using here is I am using a Milner's needle. Um, I'm doing that for a couple reasons. One, so I have a long needle so I can do kind of the cantha stitch more easily, but also because I have very bad thumb arthritis. I'm not, I usually in my videos have like black tape here, um, mostly because I those uh, braces are very it's hard to do anything with those braces on. Um, now my other leg is falling asleep, so I'm just gonna move this a little bit, get my other leg down. Um, but I have pretty bad thumb arthritis. I'm excited because in a couple weeks I can get my next cortisone shot. Um, 